Good afternoon, everyone. Let's now begin. Uh, hello and welcome to today's uh, Dot Talks webinar series with yet another exciting topic with one of our dynamic professors, Dr. Anirudha B. Babur, who will be speaking to us about the battle for Kashmir through the prism of international law. Well, I'm Dr. Rimmel Longme, head of Department of Political Science at Tetsu College, and I'm indeed very proud to introduce our speaker, who is my colleague and a good friend in the Department of Political Science. As we all know, uh, today's speaker, Dr. Anirudha B. Babar, is a man of lots of talents. So here is a few words about him. That uh, Dr. Anirudha B. Babar, currently working as assistant professor in the Department of Political Science at Chakolis, College, Dimapur, Nagaland. He is a non-practicing lawyer, former associate assistant professor of law, founding members of People's Law Center, Mumbai, an independent researcher, as well as freelance writer with interdisciplinary temperament, also a poet by heart, philosopher by nature, and an adventurer by soul. His research interest areas include international law, constitutional law, public policy, tribal studies, Southeast Asian studies, Dr. B.R. Ambeker's thoughts and philosophy, applied politics, idea of justice, peace, and conflict studies, Northeast studies, subaltern studies, gender studies, and sexuality, people's movement and human rights. So these are few areas I could you know, mention about him. He is much more than what I could mention about him. And he is a man of full of energy and compassion and also passionate in research and uh, innovation. So today's topic is in a way very interesting because uh, we are going to look at, you know, the indo park you know, border or territorial issues in a much, you know, uh, resurgent manner. So today's topic is kaleidoscopic view of battle for Kashmir through the prism of international law. So as we all know, you know, since 1947 till then, we have been, we have been, you know, uh, um, we have been, you know, uh, fighting, so to say, in our borders in order to, you know, safeguard and also preserve the sovereignty of the nation. So uh, I would like to the time Dr. Anubhi Baba for his initial talks about today's topic, Battle for Kashmir through Organization. Sir, please take your time. Sir, thank you so much. In fact, I'm... Uh, really delighted uh, to get this opportunity to speak on this uh, bit heavy, uh, complicated, and uh, sort of uncomfortable topic. People actually doesn't want to talk about it because, you know, what I have observed uh, quite often is that people only know one thing, that is uh, India has been into the battle with Pakistan since 1947. We won Kargil War, we won 1971, we won 1965, and uh, we won, uh, you know, Siachen Glacier uh, skirmishes. But uh, if you go deeper and understand the entire uh, spectrum of uh, Indo-Pakistan relationship, you will be really surprised. Because in order to understand the whole dynamic, I believe we have to go deeper. My own research, my own understanding about the problem uh, can be sourced out from two perspectives. Of course, uh, you know, the academic perspectives would be there. But I myself uh, spent a good amount of time in Kashmir. Uh, I was a student at the Jawad Institute of Mountaineer. I'm a trained mountaineer. I did my, I, I have done my 
you know, uh, the basic mountaineering course. I spent one month, uh, 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 you know, uh, in my center. Uh, during my uh, tenure uh, at my uh, center at Jawar Mountaineering Institute, I not only got opportunity uh, to understand uh, more about Kashmir from the military officers and the Jawans because they were our instructors at that point of time, but also I've got an opportunity to talk with uh, you know uh, the local people. I have been traveling to Kashmir every now and then for more than four or five times. I have visited Kashmir. So Kashmir has always been a close to my heart, not because it is beautiful, not because uh, uh, it is uh, something uh, which is considered as a crown of India, but also uh, from a conflict perspective as well. Uh, before I move, uh, let me uh, let me just uh, you know thank you. Uh, offer to all of you, you know, for joining me. I know it is not a very interesting topic, so I, I can expect the, you know, the less attendance. But anyway, let me let me just start. Uh, so, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and my dear friends, uh, I, I really thank uh, Webinar Organizing Committee for providing me this platform to share my thoughts on topic of national importance. Also, I sincerely thank my dear friend. Senior colleague and much respected professor, Dr. Rimai Longmai, for his time and uh, kind introduction. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, before I begin, I would like to recite a poem written on Kashmir by Mumtaz Ji, which is uh, very close to my heart. And I believe uh, you, know, you will also enjoy the poem. I hope I'm audible and visible enough. Poem goes like this. Oh, my lovely Kashmir, each Indian's Kashmir, mountains of amethyst appear through filmy wells, the soft air weaves. The valley of tall, dark pine trees of solemn loom dusted in powdery white. The lovely valley of flowers, the valley of apple orchards. The valley of green meadows, the mountain streams, flow with the sweet sounds amidst the grasslands. The valley of tulip fields, my mind floats in a small boat, in the dull lakes, the lowy watery ways. To see nature glows and throbs with delight, colorful birds chirping in green forest. The land of Santur welcomes you. The land of Santur welcomes you to take in breathtaking beauty, a glimpse of heaven revealed. How sorrowful, how sorrowful has this valley become. Someone is choking its life out. Smoke, smoke in this winds of conspiracies. Even the clouds here have been stained with blood. People fling homes burning, draw borders between their hearts. The grass is no longer green as the bullets rain on and wounded. The smoke has driven away the migratory birds that used to come. Oh, lovely Kashmir, crown of India, we won't spare you. India's incomplete without you. India's is nothing without you. India is empty without you. Oh, lovely Kashmir, oh my Kashmir, the crown of India, the crown of India. Ladies and gentlemen, whenever the question of Kashmir comes, or rather a word Kashmir comes, what is that first thing which comes in our mind? First thing, when I visited Kashmir for the first time, that was way long back with my parents, I was enchanted by the mountains, I was enchanted by the beauty. But if you ask a person of today that how does he perceive Kashmir, he will tell you, oh, that's a scary place. Bullets rule the hearts of the people. Bullet rules the souls of the people. That's a scary place. How far is it true? To a certain extent, it's true also. But what is the reason behind it? How it all started? Why Kashmir has become a cursed land of India? 
what is the problem i think today's uh, discussion uh, i'm going to dedicate not only to the kashmir and the, the debate of history of kashmir but also i'm going to talk about the policies of india i will be uh, commenting on strategic policies the military policies the diplomatic policies as well because i believe this is something uh, that we all uh, have to understand right because uh, there cannot be uh, one perspective to the kashmir you know the perspectives uh, of the kashmir has to uh, you know have to be developed in uh, in a multiple ways all right so please bear with me and uh, one request to all of you if you have any question uh, i will be glad to take those question you can write it those question in that uh, small chat box so that uh, you know i could uh, address them nicely so let us first understand that from the strategic and diplomatic perspective it is always said that the cartographic genius is hollow and meaningless without the might of act by the power of truth the sovereignty and jurisdiction of a state is laid out by maps and maps alone those who are students of political science and law they very well understand the strategic and diplomatic meaning of the maps the maps have been there for over 70 years and that ultimately is the official claim of india in relation to kashmir the story of kashmir started in late 1940s with the partition of india as we all know on the basis of two nation theory mr mohammad ali jinnah it was decided that all indian provinces should be divided into three categories the first was states with a hindu majority second was states with a muslim majority and dear friends and thirdly there were states which were under the governance of kings and princes that is the princely states it was decided that all hindu majority states will be given to india and all muslim majority states will go to pakistan princely states were given a choice either to join india or pakistan or to remain independent uh, that is very important to remember uh, in the interest of our further discussion so the princely states were given a choice either to join india or pakistan or if they want they can you know remain independent they can uh, you know remain sovereign as per their choice things were simple with most of the princely state states with a hindu majority and the hindu ruler joining india while states with muslim majority and the muslim rulers joined pakistan however there were states which have hindu majority but a muslim ruler for example hyderabad and states that have muslim majority and hindu ruler that is kashmir an issue was then about to get complicated and it did hyderabad became part of india when its rulers preferred to align himself with pakistan over india however issue of princely state of jammu and kashmir was still unsolved pakistan was under fear that the hindu raja of kashmir was aligning with india however his highness raja hari singh who was uh, who was then ruling you know the state of jammu and kashmir was in favor of retaining the independence of its state i mean see the ambition of, of uh, raja hari singh he was not in favor of kashmir he was not in favor of india he was not in favor of nehru he was not in favor of barrister mohammad ali jinnah he was uh, he was listening to his own heart but who knows maybe uh, you know uh, raja hari singh at that time you know he was contemplating on a uh, switzerland model i hope uh, uh, you know you know what switzerland model is all about if you understand uh, the the the, uh, the spectrum of international politics you will find that there there is one country which is absolutely neutral and that country has declared uh, its foreign policy is an absolute unconditional neutral foreign policy which is that country that is switzerland so as a return of a uh, swiss stand the official swiss stand switzerland has received a uh, protection uh, from all the countries so maybe you never know that raja hari singh was also uh, contemplating you know to have a similar kind of uh, you know uh, how to say 
a scheme uh, for jammu and kashmir however uh, he had to come out of his dream he was dreaming because soon he received the news that the conspiracy to dethrone him has already been hatched and muslims have revolted against him with the support of pakhtun tribal supported by pak army uh, i'm going to talk about a uh, little bit in detail in you know uh, in the coming discussion now let us understand this is the background okay in this background you have to understand our you know further discussion uh, uh, in relation to the kashmir and the, the the problems of the kashmir you know now see india has claimed all of pakistan occupied kashmir since the instrument of accession through which the aswal trust state of went kashmir acceded to india uh, that uh, uh, document was signed in 1947 by the last dogra king of kashmir uh, that is uh, his highness maharaja hari singh Uh, by executing this document under the pro provisions of the Indian Independence Act 1947 now i want you to remember another keyword that is indian independence act so the validity of the accession document legally speaking was derived from the indian independence act 1947 so maharaja hari singh agreed to accede to the dominion of india the indo pakistan war of 1947 between pakistani militia consisted of forces from western districts of the day, jammu and kashmir state backed by pakistani pakhtun tribesmen the pakhtun uh, you know if you uh, pakhtun tribesmen are those people who are uh, you know if you take a map of pakistan they are tribally inhabitants of the western uh, province of uh, uh, you know kashmir uh, sorry western province of uh, pakistan okay and the indian army established the rough boundaries today with the pakistan holding roughly one third of kashmir and india one half with dividing line of control established by the united nations so the battle of kashmir the first battle of kashmir as uh, professor rimi also quoted uh, in his introduction that that first battle of kashmir uh, was actually uh, between the rebels the rebel the in an army pakhtun rebels wanted to eat out kashmir but they were badly defeated and then united nations was uh, involved in the entire dispute then the cease fire was declared and in that cease fire uh, one resolution was passed by united nations security council and i am heavily relying on that resolution because dear friends many people are not aware about the existence of this resolution so i request all of you if possible and if you have a uh, deeper interest in the uh, in the uh, please uh, find united nations security council resolution of uh, 1948 that resolution has you know uh, so many hidden things which you know the common man doesn't know so the united nations security council resolution of 1948 clearly states that pakistan is an actor state number 2 issue is between jammu and kashmir and india number 3 pakistan has to vacate all occupied territory in state that it occupied by force and hand over the vacated territory to india number 4 india has to remove all its forces living aside enough to maintain law and order number 5 india to conduct plebiscite in state however as per the official records pakistan asked for time to vacate its occupation but it never complied i mean uh, you know if you just go through the government documents available at that point of time and maximum documents you can access to you know the the lok sabha archives plus you can access those documents to the defense ministries you know uh, even in the external affairs ministries and the home ministries you know then you will come to know that no matter what the united nations security council resolution of 1948 says uh pakistan did not comply uh with the resolution in toto as one third state of jammu and kashmir was under the occupation of pakistan and this was taken as non compliance of necessary legal conditions leading to plebiscite hence india could never conduct plebiscite in state of jammu and kashmir uh in law uh see i'll tell you okay uh, in law we understand that one thing is required to complete another thing right 
one provision if it is not in relation to the another provision then both provisions and both the requirements has to be understood independently because they are not connected together and when they connected together then only you can derive some legal interpretation out of it and this is the crux of the problem right india was willing to perform its obligation under united nations security council resolution of 1948 but unfortunately at that point of time pakistan was still holding of course it is still also i mean at this point of time one third part of the kashmir and as per the resolution unless and until pakistan removed its armed forces from uh, from the land it, uh, it has been occupied by virtue of 1947 1948 kashmir war there was no reason for india or india was not in a position to uh, you know to conduct a plebiscite a public plebiscite it was not that that india never wanted to conduct plebiscite but if but plebiscite is not something you know which comes from the sky you need a legal foundation for that isn't it and legal foundation is united nation resolution of 1948 and that resolution says that if this 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 and this condition is fulfilled then only this 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 condition is going to be fulfilled so this is how it is so onus was even at that at that time in 1948 was on pakistan to perform its obligation and show its uh, uh, you know bona fide intentions now then what happened india could not conduct plebiscite in the state okay now let us understand what is the meaning of this state which reference to you know uh, 1948 united nations security council that is also very important to understand the state is not what we understand today you know that is pakistan occupied kashmir azad kashmir india and aksai chin no if you take out the old map of jammu and kashmir the traditional map of jammu and kashmir the traditional map of jammu and kashmir the jurisdiction of raja hari singh and his dogra ancestors were actually controlling the larger part of aksai chin you know even the ladakh then jammu and kashmir uh, uh, even gilgit baltistan and entire pakistan occupied kashmir so that entire part was belonging to the family of uh, raja hari singh right which they got from the british that is another story you know it's very interesting they were not the traditional rulers of the kashmir by the way they got this uh you know this kashmir region jammu and kashmir from the britishers okay they purchased it from the britishers anyway so uh that that was the case now this idea of the state or the concept of state has been understood in reference to the concept of state as understood before 1947 right that is very important to understand right now uh this includes pop gilgit baltistan jammu ladakh kashmir valley so on and so forth as i have already told you now see when this chaos was happening something which is known as dixon plan came out uh that dixon plan was proposed in 1950 uh and according to that dixon plan the territory occupied by india to remain with india and territory occupied by pakistan remain in pakistan and plebiscite to be conducted only in kashmir valley also could not be materialized due to adamant position held by pakistan by not complying with the legal requirement of unsc resolution now here are two cases one case is united nations security council 1948 and the second case is you know a dixon plan this which was proposed in 1950 now under dixon plan it was said that okay fine let us come to the uh, let us come to you know some sort of negotiating point let pakistan occupied region be with pakistan let indian occupied region be with india and let there be a plebiscite in the indian occupied region so that was a that was a kind of plan which is proposed in 1950 but obviously this proposal of mr dixon which is known as dixon plan is in direct contravention to the law laid down by virtue of unsc resolution 1948 and since we are talking about international law a treaty is a law right and you cannot just nullify one treaty by invoking another plan or another treaty or getting parties to sign to another treaty right so uh, this uh, dixon plan also completely uh, uh, you know disposed of 
because uh, india stood on its position that pakistan required to be fulfill uh, its legal obligation under unsc resolution of 1948 now what happened next in 1947 so many things have happened two nation theory you know uh, was uh, developed by uh, barrister jina then uh, muslim league was also involved and you know the riots occurred then mahatma gandhi's uh, uh, you know uh, role uh, mahatma gandhi's position right mahatma gandhi wanted unified india but you know so many things have happened you know there even dr ambedkar's role uh, against uh, kashmir uh, sorry against pakistan so many things have happened at that point of time but what was happening at the ground level in kashmir many people did not know about it remember i spoke about pakhtun militia now listen the strategic rise of pakhtun militia in 1947 and its support under the influence and command of the pakistan army to the orchestrated rebellion against maharaja hari singh that broke out in poonch jagir in 1947 june 1947 laid down the foundation of so called militancy in jammu and kashmir which bore its fruits in the late 80s now you may ask me a question that what is the reason of that muslim rebellion against hari singh see i'll tell you pakistan was under impression that according to a uh, two nation theory and ac according to the religious base of the two nation theory hindu supposed to remain in india or hindu dominated part should remain in india and muslim dominated part supposed to go to pakistan so what is the position of kashmir at that point of time kashmir had a very strong king and that king wanted to be independent he had his very own strong ambitions the political ambitions but that was not to happen pakistan threatened pakistan started threaten uh, uh, you know raja hari singh and raja hari singh came under pressure and he had signed the, uh, the accession document right and stan's nightmare came to be true finally raja hari singh aligned with india and therefore at that time you know uh, uh, the uh, uh, the muslims of kashmir valley they were been agitated and uh, they were encouraged to revolt by the pakhtun militia and that pakhtun militia was an inhabitant of the western frontier of uh, pakistan uh, these were in that now see uh, that uh, roots of that uh, seeds of militia militancy which was laid down in 1947 started bearing its fruit in late 80s in the valley we will come out we will come to that now see from the battle of 1947 we moved to battle of 1965 the uh, which is known as uh, asal uttar from 1965 we moved to battle of 1971 of course uh, uh, you know we 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 supported ba bangladeshis we supported uh, mukti vahini movement no doubt about that but a curious thing also happened uh, at that point of time that was shimla agreement and in shimla agreement one provision also was discussed and it was discussed because see we were having uh, the, uh, the the higher weight in shimla agreement so we uh, to pakistan is that see under shimla agreement we also want to make you understand that uh, the the problems uh, of kashmir right is not an international problem rather it is a problem originally it was originally between jammu kashmir and the state of india state of jammu kashmir and state of india but now it should be a bilateral talk between pakistani government and indian government and no third party should come and interfere in the affairs so that was uh, i believe a diplomatic victory for india because uh, the shimla agreement uh, i consider it is very significant in this case so from 1971 uh, i would not immediately move to kargil war but from 1971 anything started to happen right india was growing economically militarily as a superpower right gradually uh, and at the same time so many things were happening and changing in jammu and kashmir see before 1980s uh, it is said that kashmir was relatively peaceful you might uh, you might come across many uh, you know bollywood movies hindi movies they were shot at kashmir so kashmir was relatively uh, very uh, peaceful at that point of time but what happened after 80s 
and that is something which we really need to understand as a student of political science international relation and the and the citizen of india we should understand that something really abnormal started happening in the kashmir valley if you want to win the population how do you win what does the strategic affairs expert says if you want to win the population number one you, you try to win the population by way of your uh, political might by way of uh, your uh, military might or you may use something else more deadly more powerful than any military and that is the religion and this is what pakistan have started to do with the help of cia kashmir kashmiri muslim is very different than the muslim in you know the mainland india and i'll tell you why because they were never radicalized history tells us that kashmir was dominated by buddhist traditions you know the entire region was dominated by buddhism uh, right up to uh, kandahar and the central asia then it was also dominated at some point of time in the history by shaivite traditions of hinduism and then later on in i think in 11th or 12th century then uh, kashmir fell to the hands of uh, muslims and then uh, you know the the islamic influence have started to occur but that is uh, that is in the medieval age right but primarily speaking it was hinduism and buddhism which was very dominant uh, in kashmir valley so kashmir muslim is bit different they are soft spoken they are sorted and they were never radicalized but rather they were made to be radical they were taught radicalism by systematic religious agenda have you heard about wahhabism said that wahhabism is a radical islam it's a it's a radical school of islam and very i'm very open about it you know because i spoke with two of my friends now one of them is an IS, ips officer he is from kashmir cadder and he told me that sir are you that this is the radicalism this is wahhabism which has ruined everything at the kashmir so when religion was used as a political tool to achieve the political aims and objects then what do you expect my dear friends a disaster and this is what exactly happened in 80s of kashmir you found people became more radical they being brainwashed against uh, you know against the india but that approach did not last longer because at this point of time if you just look around you will come to know that maximum kashmiri youth they want peace they want good education they want service they want dignity are you understand are you able to understand what is the meaning of dignity and it is very nice to hear you know those type of things from kashmiri youth so kashmir has gone through transitions and modern kashmir the kashmir of 2020 is totally different kashmir but if you just understand the dynamics of terrorism in the kashmir valley what do you see kashmir valley is not a breeding kashmir valley uh, kindly i will take questions later on i will take questions later on i still have time i believe i will take questions later on systematically so kashmir is a breeding is it a breeding ground of terrorism i don't believe that kashmir is not a breeding ground of terrorism but rather they are being influenced by the outsiders so maximum terror is uh, maximum uh, you know the terrorists which has been killed uh, by the armed forces neutralized by the armed forces they were foreign terrorist and of course they had their support uh, supporting element in the valley but by the way do you know one thing this entire political disputes entire this 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 hula balu about this terrorism and all it's concentrated in a very small region of jammu and kashmir jammu is relatively very uh, safe and peaceful ladakh is happy relatively peaceful the problem lies in a, a small pocket of hardly three or four districts that too in the kashmir okay punch is one of them uh, because you know i i referred to punch jagir when revolt started happening in 1947 uh, against raja hari singh that was the case now see now you must have uh, have had idea about you know what exactly the kashmir is all about right and what is the role of uh, pakistan over there
and you must have got little bit idea about what is the legal position of india see pakistan let me tell you about the pakistan's legal position number 1 pakistan considers the uh, the uh, this accession document as a fraud they are very open about it they don't consider this document as a legal document at all second the second position is uh, uh, they still uh, believe in two nation theory which is based on religion and they think that you know since kashmir uh, is dominated by muslim the kashmir is dominated by islam and the maximum population is so kashmir should go to pakistan right see they should understand and all the scholars of diplomatic studies also should understand that kashmir is not jugad kashmir is not hyderabad are you getting my point i'm specifically using these two cases in reference to nawab of hyderabad and nawab of jugad they went to pakistan they fled to pakistan because uh, nawab the people wanted to india but in case kashmir Raja Hari Singh, the emperor, was not interested either in the Nehru policy or in Jinna policy. He wanted to, you know, keep his hold on as long as it is possible. But that was not possible, you know. So the document was signed. Now, what is the present condition? Now, see. Uh, if you consider the geographic location of Kashmir. you will find that it is strategically very important kashmir has its boundary uh, attached to uh, uh, china uh, uh, china tibetan region then kashmir has its boundary uh, attached to pakistan of course this side it is india and kashmir uh, you know northwest frontier is a gateway to the central asia that also we cannot forget and from the eastern side the uh, the kashmir is a traditional way via a karakoram tract okay and the uh, side chain then via khotan you know it's a traditional uh, uh, road okay which has been used by the people to enter in indian subcontinent right so now you you can imagine you know even strategically also you know the, the location of kashmir is uh, you know very very important okay now see kashmir has been eyed by pakistan kashmir has been eyed by china also many people now they come to know but many people doesn't know that even the china also you know stolen our uh yeah sure no problem yeah. so china also stole uh, you know our uh, uh, kashmir uh, in 19 uh, kashmir region 960 especially uh, in the ladakh so when it comes to the akai chin area and when it comes to uh, Aksai Chin and uh, the Karakoram Tract, yes, and the Karakoram Tract. That region was under the is under the part of uh, you know the Aksai Chin area. And by the way, for your kind information, there is one famous statement given by our Pandit Nehru, right? And that famous statement, I, I I cannot recall the exact source, but that is somewhere. Okay, you can find it out. He said that what what kind of crop grows there in that region? He was referring to Karakoram Tract, and he was referring to Aksai Chin. what crop does it grow there what life does it grow there where is the life over there and that kind of loose statement was uh, you know given by the prime minister of india and now just imagine why 1999 kargil war was very important because again we we were backstabbed by the by, by the pakistan and it was understanding that uh, you know the military post required to be vacated in the uh, nearby the siachen siachen glaciers and those vac uh, vacated posts will be uh, in the summer will be reoccupied by pakistan army and the indian army but in the winter uh, but in the winter what happened indians have vacated the post and pakistan captured those vacated post of india and this is how the kargil started and i'll tell you one thing very clearly about this kashmir issue and indo pakistan dispute besides terrorism besides hatred besides confusion let me tell you the common pakistani has doesn't have to do anything with the dispute the way the common indians doesn't have to do uh, with this dispute right now here the problem with the pakistan is pakistan never had a democracy pakistan always had military autocracy as their government and fighting war 
against india is not in the interest of the pakistan is not in the interest of the pakistanis but rather it is in the interest of the pakistan army you always need strategic justification isn't it and this is what it is now here the question is not just a terrorism here is the question is how are we going to tackle the pak army in my uh, introduction paper if you can if you, if you could have gone through it i have categorically mentioned that uh, uh, the diplomatic channels have completely been failed down do you know why diplomatic channels between india and pakistan have failed down because pakistani government was all, all, always and forever since 1947 was under the influence of pakistan army general yahya khan general tikka khan general parvez musharraf i can give tell you so many names which were far more superior than their prime ministers and the presidents when kargil war happened it is uh, on record it is mentioned that nawaz sharif was kept in the dark nawaz sharif had no idea that the pakistan forces have captured the indian post and um, you know this uh, parvez musharraf proudly stated that we captured indian post are on what basis by keeping your own prime minister in the dark so see this is the dynamics and to challenge that dynamics sir i request five more minutes uh, to to tackle this dynamics now india has resorted to various military policies the first military policy that india has devised to number one the strategic uh, the strategic uh, uh, attacks and uh, the surgical strike now many people have raised hue and cry about you know what is the position of india what is the legal position of india to go into a sovereign country and uh, uh, and uh, attack uh, the people and come back well i'll tell you in the law of sea there is one doctrine called doctrine of hot pursuit what does the doctrine of hot pursuit says since i i, I studied international law and uh, i know it very well because why why am i so confident because doctrine of hot pursuit was limited to the law of sea but it was america and many other countries especially israel they expanded doctrine of hot pursuit take an example of munich olympic i hope you know what happened in the munich olympic the olympians the israeli olympians were murdered by hamas right then uh, 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 you know what happened in case of osama bin laden at abu tabar pakistan government had no idea what was happening some from somewhere the american troopers came the you know they they took uh, you know quick action they finish uh, the dreaded terrorist osama bin laden they disappeared and that's all so it is not india which has tried to expand the legal uh, interpretation interpretation of doctrine of a uh, hot pursuit but it has already been done second is a doctrine of self defense doctrine of, under the doctrine of self defense the war is justified war is a big word war is actually a big word but even if you take commando actions the military actions even if you initiate surgical strikes they are also valid under the doctrine of self defense when we know very well with reference to the evidences that the external affairs ministry of india have produced from time to time to various international uh, uh, communities on different various international platforms that pakistan is nourishing the terrorist launch pads and still no action has been taken what do you expect that needs to be initiated if not a surgical strike it's it's a big question nobody wants war war is a disaster war is destruction but what what is the option when somebody comes again and again and again to your house and starts slapping you again and again and go back to his house and you have nothing else to do so here uh, as i told you before that uh, i'll be so speaking on doctrine of hot pursuit and uh, doctrine of self defense this is very two important documents uh, do doctrines under international law hello sir 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 you have three sir. more minutes okay three more minutes please oh sir sure, sure, sure. in Wrap three more minutes three more yeah. yes yes yeah. and as per the and as per the latest position our meteorological department had started showing weather of pakistan occupied kashmir and i will end my talk with my interpretation
now let us understand in 1971 uh, when Mukti Vahini started its movement in Bangladesh, I mean, Mukti Vahini started its movement in way back in 19, uh, 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 early 1960s. Okay. But uh, it was culminated into full fledged war in uh, 60, uh, 68 and 69 and 70s. Then India also started showing, uh, uh, you know, the weather of Dhaka. If you can just go back to the history, you will come to know. It was symbolic in nature. Why was it symbolic in nature and what is why is it so important from strategic perspective and the diplomatic perspective? Let me tell you. When one sovereign country try to show up the part of another sovereign country, that simply means that it is claiming its region and it is giving a signal to that. And let us not forget, in 93 or 94, Indian Parliament have unanimously passed a resolution which is available on internet that Pakistan occupied Kashmir is an unalienable part of India. And why it is an unalienable part of India? The answer lies in United Nations Security Council resolution of, of 1947. So my dear friends, the question is not for a common man. Common man like you and me, who are struggling for daily survival. They are nothing to do with this diplomatic and military issues and all. But let me tell you, when it comes to terrorism, when it comes to illegal military actions, then yes, a common man is bound to be suffocated. A common man, a common Indian bound to be targeted. And therefore, it is our duty to at least understand what is happening around us. So the question is, Kashmir belongs to whom? Undoubtedly, Kashmir belongs to India. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ani, uh, for very insightful talks that you have uh, delivered uh, this afternoon. It is. Uh, it was a, uh, really an eye opener, a thought provoking, and an inspiration to search for the truths. And uh, since it is um, happening, uh, you know, again and again, and then you know, uh, even the future is um, it will will look uh, like that something you know in the border will happen. So I would uh, rather put it in the, another way that. Uh, uh, it is a developing story, and uh, therefore, I think you have uh, you sell through with lots of you know uh, you know facts and lot of uh, important points for us to ponder upon. And we we really thank you for your time, and uh, we could see uh, the energy, we could see the knowledge, we could see the uh, hard work that you have put in. So we thank you so much, sir. We are very lucky. And um, we are blessed uh, this afternoon to hear from you. So many, you know, things you have touched, uh, you know, during your uh, sharing. So you started uh, with your uh, with your association of the Kashmir, beautiful place, and then again you go by the poem, the crown of India, and then you have to touch upon so many things. Thank you so very much for all these great points that um, the most important thing is you have initiated, you know, a revolution in all of us so that we can start, you know, looking into this story in a much more, you know, uh, serious manner. So now uh, let us enter into, uh, you know, uh, the um, Q&A session. Uh, in the beginning, I want to give more time to search so I do not tell every one of you. Uh, kindly feel free. Uh, to, you know, type your queries, uh, you know, in the chat box, or you can also unmute your mi microphone and uh, ask. And I request Dr. Ani, a uh, speaker, to be very uh, succinct and precise and brief. And uh, first of all, uh, let us take up the question given by uh, Dr. Debrabata. Uh, do you think Muslim fundamentalists backed by Pakistan army is responsible for conflict in Kashmir and related to that is what is the UN stand with regard to Kashmir issue so I would like to request a speaker to respond to this mm, okay uh, sir thank you so much um, I think uh, uh, you know this this topic has been uh, you know uh, nationally very important so i thought that i should take up and speak on it 
rather I show all of you, you know, for your patient uh, hearing. Anyway, so uh, Dr. Devrata has uh, given these two interesting questions, and I was uh, just, uh, you know, willing to give their answer in a precise manner. So the first question is, do you think Muslim fundamentalists back up uh, by Pakistan armies responsible for conflict in Kashmir? Now let us uh, first understand, okay, what is the meaning of Pakistan army? I mean, it, it's very interesting, okay, to understand the character of Pakistan army. Uh, fortunately, when I was uh, studying my international law, you know, I got an opportunity uh, to discuss about uh, the, the strategic affairs uh, and, uh, you know, uh, some, uh, some uh, how to say, the military science with uh, some of the people, okay, who were serving with uh, the Indian Armed Forces at a, a retired at a very, uh, you know, high, from a higher position. Okay, uh, I, I was from Pune. I mean, I studied my international law from Pune University. So it is just, you know, in the vicinity or nearby National Defense Academy. So we get opportunity to interact with those people. Anyway, the most important thing is uh, the character of, uh, you know, uh, Pakistan army. Pakistan army, yes, uh, since it is a Islamic Republic of Pakistan, the nature and character of Pakistan army is essentially religious character, unlike Indian army. Indian army, or maybe US Army, or even maybe the British Army, they don't recognize religion. And it is true also. Many of your relatives must be serving in the armed forces, so they should know. They, they will tell you that our armed force does not recognize any religion. But Pakistan has some different uh, way of structuring their armed forces. Okay, So they believe in religion, they believe in religious doctrines, so on and so forth. Now here the question is whether uh, you know the religious fundamentalist backup by Pakistan army uh, is responsible. Well, I'll tell you, okay, religious fundamentalists are not born. Are you getting my point, uh, sir? Religious fundamentalists are not born. Religious fundamentalists are created. They are created. And I have rightly given you the example that what happened in Kashmir Valley in the 80s. A Kashmiri Muslim is very different. He's very nice. He doesn't know any radicalism. But they were made to radicalized, right, by by uh, planting uh, the the Wahhabist ideals, the Wahhabist influences, the Wahhabist uh, traditions and the philosophy. And I urge each one of you to go through and read the Wahhabist literature. You will get goosebumps. Sufism is at the soul of Kashmiri Islam. Do you know that? Just read the, uh, the the literature produced by the Kashmiri uh, Sufi Sufi scholars. So that is the problem, right? The radical radical people were created in the valley, and those radical people became puppets in the hands of the CIA and the Pakistan armed forces. Pakistan, look at the map of Pakistan. Can Pakistan uh, fight with India directly? Pakistan cannot do that. They do not have a ground. I mean, just one one push of the our single division and pakistan is gone it is true because you need a ground to sustain so pakistan you know devised another strategy so they created radicalism radical people the radical people became puppet in the hands of uh, you know pakistan army and cia and they started creating havoc so in that way uh, you know i would say yes the Muslim fundamentalist, radical, uh, radical people who were created, they were not there, they were created and they were started backing Pak army or Pak policy in Kashmir. Now, what is the UN standpoint with regard to Kashmir issue? Okay, now I have already spoken uh, on this issue in reference to United Nations Security Council resolution of uh, 1948. Uh, what happened is that in case of uh, that resolution, United Nations have already made people understand that they are having their presence in the issue. Okay. And uh, if you go to Srinagar, you may find that UN office is also there in the Srinagar, right? But what happened in Simla agreement is that, you know, it was mutually decided that the issue is not an uh, international issue. It is an issue between India and Pakistan. Okay. So, uh, 
if you can understand that the un uh, has uh, lost its jurisdiction because of that uh, let me tell you Un united nations cannot interfere in the problem of two countries unless and until both the countries are willing to uh, uh, you know get the services of the united nations that is very true united nation peacekeeping forces that's another thing but when it comes to observation group when it comes to united nations support when it comes to united nation platform come on your and mine consent is required right so in 1971 uh, it was i said that it was a diplomatic victory for india so in shimla agreement one of the provisions of the agreement was that, that let there be bilateral talks no third party should be involved in that you know so this is uh, i believe uh, yeah you know, yeah i think the un does not have uh, yeah points is thank you uh, and, uh, thank you anirudh doctor thank you doctor anirudh so uh, yes sir i understood uh, i understood uh, the standpoint of un uh, so it's a bilateral issue it's a bilateral issue it should be it should be it is yes. it is so yeah. i think uh, it is uh, the pakistan army i think uh, in order to make their presence and then pakistan's generals the army officials they have their vision i think uh, to 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 dominate politics or something like that so they know that uh, it, actually it is not an issue at all since uh, uh, raja hari singh um, he signed an accord with indian government and pakistan was a part of india so actually uh, there exists no reason for pakistan to claim indian territory that's the final thing i suppose and uh, what i believe okay. is that oh, this uh. is my opinion uh, do you yeah. think uh, this uh, pakistan army and pakistan pol politicians maybe uh, they are using this uh, policy instruments in order to make their uh, in order to realize their political ambitions uh, mr andrad mm. all right you got my question oh, okay yeah, okay i got it i got it Doctor, Doctor Ani, uh, just uh, want to request you that uh, the point that sir is uh, asking has been already uh, mentioned in your talk, and then uh, thank you very much. Uh, now uh, uh, we would like to move on to the another query from. Uh, I mean, uh, we will ask for two more uh, questions if anyone would like to ask, and uh, we will continue to you know take uh, some of the points that Sir Debrita has put forward uh, later. So I would like to request um, other participants who would like to just put a uh, query in brief. Anyone before we actually close our session? If anyone would like to, you know, put forward uh, some uh, your viewpoints or uh, something that you want to know from a speaker, please unmute your mic and uh, please go ahead. you can write it down also no problem as such yeah we will we will wait for yeah. one last question please feel free so if there is no question you can also ask question <laughs> okay okay um <laughs> our last question from my side um i'm so uh, happy uh, once again that i could gather so many points from the talk um i would like to uh, mention one thing that uh, uh one of the important thing that uh, looking like missing out is uh, the drawing of or the demarcation of the boundary line by sir cyril uh, radcliffe so uh, we have a radcliffe you know uh, line uh, demark you know demarcated between india and pakistan and that affects bengal also so i think uh, sir can you just throw uh, a light on that uh, you know you know it was done it was done by the british uh, uh, what do you call administrator sir cyril uh, radcliffe so uh, can you just throw for china we have macmahon uh, macmahon line uh, that is there for pakistan and india we have this uh, radcliffe line so is there any dispute of that line you know st starting from the british time 
leading to this uh, current you know conflict situation uh, sir yeah. can, you, can you can you can you tell me when radcliffe line was drawn the year uh, actually um, it was drawn in 1914 Uh, I, I, is it uh, 1914 now listen <laughs> now listen i'll tell you okay hmm. uh there are different proposals were initiated okay no sorry not 1914 when we sorry. speak about uh, when we exactly that that is why when we speak about uh, macmohan line when we speak about radcliffe line when we speak about line of control and when we speak about line of actual control <laughs> a common man gets confused yeah okay so see every line every line uh, has its own purpose right and ratcliffe line uh, even though it might have been existed but uh, you know uh, when it comes to line of control okay which is considered as a, a official line on ground not see basically a loc it's still in dispute but official line on ground by virtue of 1947 48 battle by virtue of uh, united nations security council resolution of 1948 the aired so what was before loc what was before a uh, line of control automatically gets nullified from the platform of legal position that is point number 1 but academically it, uh, you know we can understand that right second important thing is uh, when it comes to china see i'll tell you okay china has occupied more than 10000 square kilometer of uh, uh, you know oxai chain and uh, that is that is truth right and they wanted to gain a more weightage by incursing in uh, you know the ladakh region that is also true and now our military forces our forces are very strong at that point of time you know even in kargil what happened do you know the location of kargil because you are talking about boundaries now that is why i am you know giving this small small example sir right why why pakistan dare, dare to do this you know misadventure in kargil right to have a control over kargil heights and why kargil heights do you know sir because from kargil heights you can directly attack to the leh ladakh communication and if the leh ladakh communication is break down the india is completely spastic it is india is completely gone down losing its strategic importance right so that is why you know when it comes to the boundaries sir unfortunately we are so unlucky that we had very bad neighbors right nobody bothers about the boundary neither pakistan nor uh, your china and unfortunately god knows what is happening with nepal now and i'm sure one day i will organize one uh, one talk on nepal also they started talking about you know lipluk and other 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 issues right and why that is necessary for india it itself from the wrath of china at the end you know so that is a problem so to answer your direct query okay okay, okay. Uh, that, is line nullified by loc and loc is in dispute as as disputable as lsc line of actual control and it is all about the strategic importance from the military perspective that is that is the only thing oh, oh okay sir okay so the point is noted and thank you once again and uh, i would like to uh, conclude uh, our sessions uh, by thanking you know our, our professor our speaker one of the dynamic professors in tatso college and also i would like to uh, thank you know uh, those uh, who put uh, put forward some queries and then uh, enter into discussion as i uh, once again uh, uh, remind you all that today's talk is very encompassing in nature very exhaustive in one sense and so many facts uh, facts laden talk so uh, towards the end i would like to say that uh, uh, one question still keep uh, one questions keep on coming to our mind nowadays uh, when we talk about india pak and india uh, china you know relations uh, with regard to territorial claims and counter claims and uh, that one thing that keeps on disturbing us is that are we fighting a losing battle because uh, that is the question that keep coming to us because when we look at we have you know in the uh, the
uh, Kashmir. And then also uh, we have uh, Pakistan, uh, uh, we have the different, uh, uh, what they call territories, which are already uh, divided, you know, among India, Pakistan and China. So I think when I look at the map, which is, uh, though India probably maintained the map, but in reality, you know, so much of, so a big, uh, big chunk of Indian territory has been already, you know, uh, you know, ceded to our uh, so-called, as the uh, speaker has said, uh, our bad neighbor, so to say. So uh, thank you so much, everyone, for availing, I mean, uh, I mean, uh, um, uh, being taking part in this talk. And um, we hope to, you know, continue uh, lots more on the, what they call emerging issues, uh, which are continuing uh, and which are developing in nature. I would like to sincerely thank, you know, that's so college dot talk, you know, within a series platform and all the, uh, uh, all the, all our, all the people associated with it. And I would like to thank our speaker once again, Dr. Anirudha, may God bless you more with uh, uh, knowledge and wisdom. And I thank every one of you for staying till the end of the talk and uh, hope that, you know, uh, we learned something today. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you all. Thank you so much. If you have any other query, you can talk to me personally. Thank you so much. Have a great afternoon.